Wabung is a position paper or policy paper of the Manitoba Indian Brotherhood that was uh, written in 1971. Um, and it's a statement by the chiefs of Manitoba on what they wanted in economic development, community development, health, um, education, and so forth. It was meant as a, a seminal document that was going to guide people's thinking um, over the years ahead. And also, uh, it was needed as a, a policy document from one level of government to another, meaning Indian government, as, as that was the terminology of the time, Indian government to um, mostly the federal government. Well, the impact it had was to actually preserve our status as uh, First Nation people. Wabung was a very significant part of our history, you know, where our people were in a time of resurgence. Our people were struggling to break free. That's why the position paper of Wabung is so important to remember because it's, a, it's our history that was written by ourselves. So Wabung, you know, in the 60s, through that actual participation of, of the community, the people and the leaders, it's a very significant document. So to think of a, you know, specific vision at that time, there was a hope and there was a, almost like a, a dream that things were had to improve, things had to change, and things have changed. On October the 7th, 1971, the Manitoba Indian Brotherhood, representing 54 bands of Manitoba Indians, presented their position paper, named Wabong, to the Minister of Indian Affairs and Northern Development, the Honorable Jean Chrétien. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Briere. I was uh, Jocelyn Wilson at that time. I was the uh, acting director of consultations and negotiations. Uh, while we were working on the paper and towards the almost completion, Dave uh, Cushane, the president of the Manitoba Indian Brotherhood, called us into his office. We brainstormed. He facilitated the brainstorming, and that's how we came up with Wabung. The position paper has been called Wabung. Wabung means our tomorrow, and this is for us to look into the future of what the Indians of Manitoba, the Indian tribes of Manitoba wish to happen in this province. I'm Janet Fontaine, Janet Spence Fontaine, and I um, worked on Wabang, um, pulling together the, the health section of that document. So the vision of Wabang, um, some of the time it was just to get this done because we knew that it was important. We knew it was going to be presented to the Prime Minister and we knew that we had to be on top of our, of our subject areas. I just had this feeling, okay, we'll, we'll all do our best right now and that's what everyone did. We just worked to the best of our knowledge and ability. And so I had been a teacher, I had been a principal, I had been a guidance counselor, I'd been a supervisor of schools, you know. And, uh, and so with all this uh, background and experience, I felt that I did want to have something to do with a policy that was going to affect education for our people, you know. So that was how I ended up uh, the key person to work on the education part. You know, I use a, a number of statistics in, in my report, for example, that shows that uh, at least 90% of our students were not graduating uh, from grade 12. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, I mean, scandalous even, <laughs> I mean, at that time, you know, to have that. And, uh, and this was, um, I, I like to point out the fact that Indian Affairs was running these schools, and that's their record. 90% of dropout rate, you know, so something was wrong there. 
You know, the document of, of Wabang deserves, you know, to be heard. I'm known as uh, Dave Cushane, the son of the late uh, Grand Chief Dave Cushane. And Wabang certainly became, a, you know, the, the voice of the people as it was expressed within the document. And the other thing that I feel that, uh, that is absolutely important, which, which applies just as much today, is that those leaders at that time in the 60s, and certainly my father was, was, was one of the, the prominent leaders of that time, is that what they did is they opened the door for us to reclaim our identity as a people. In 1969, when the White Paper was drafted by, the, by Trudeau's government at the time, and John Chrétien was the Indian Affairs Minister, Indigenous people across Turtle Island rejected it resoundingly. The primary reason for rejecting the 1969 White Paper at the time was because there was no legal foundation upon which Indigenous people could find themselves and sustain themselves outside of the Indian Act and outside of treaties. And the, the, the idea around the 1969 White Paper to remove treaties, to remove the distinct legal status of Indigenous people, would have left Indigenous people within a vast ocean of, of, of colonial law, uh, an, an ocean of laws that, that uh, did not apply and did not take into context the unique history of who we are as original people. It would have had the effect of terminating Indian rights and um, that, that was not acceptable. So all of the organizations, all of the Indian organizations across Canada did a thinking person's paper of how they would want the future to look as a government to government um, effort. The position paper is a culmination of the, of the discussion, consultation that have taken place the last year with the 54 bands in Manitoba. There was also the research that we had done the historical development uh, and what had taken place over the last hundred years and showing what the conditions are today as far as the Indian community is concerned. There is statistical background there to support the conditions that we outline in the present situation. But most important of all, it contains a direction in which the Indian people would like to participate in their own country. Yeah. It may have seemed like it was in reaction to a, a government document, but it was more than that. It was really a time of um, self-determination. Um, it, was, it was generally a time of rethinking where we were and wanting a different, better relationship with, uh, with government. The Indian people of Manitoba are not playing games. And this paper that we have presented to you today is not a political ploy. The 1969 White Paper, however, uh, was, a, I believe, a, an attempt to, um, to eradicate, you know, certain recognitions that are due uh, to Indigenous people. And in that light, we, we needed to take a position as the original people to articulate ourselves, not from within the spheres of our own political uh, political groupings, but externally. We needed to articulate in English and in some cases French how we felt about uh, what the initiatives of the federal government was at the time. And to that end we created Wabung here in Manitoba. Wabung was a reflection of the foundational principles of how we operate our governance within the, the newly developing Canadian political landscape that was here. And since then many of our people reflect upon Wabung as a foundational document which guides us even today. And it all stems back to Wabung. You know, you just, we can't take these things lightly because it, it was the thrust. It was what woke up a lot of people to a lot of things, especially the, the governments in, in a sense, even though they didn't say, okay, okay, here's, here's all the help we can give you, but at least they understood and then we could try to negotiate. And our paper is a paper of cooperation. It makes reasonable recommendations and it was written with the attitude that the government is prepared to cooperate and therefore we are too. So we worked hard at the at Rivers to get the document ready 
a golden document ready for presentation to Christian. And uh, worked late into the night and late in, and early next morning just to be sure that it, uh, it was ready. For your information, our staff had to work till six o'clock this morning. Our Xerox broke down and a number of other things developed as well. Yes, I, I did attend the presentation at Rivers, but yes, there were, were a number of meetings and they were large and there was discussion. Um, uh, people were very good about receiving the information. In his reply, the Honorable Jean Chrétien thanked Chief Dave Crochet and officials from the Manitoba Indian Brotherhood for the well-researched and clearly presented position paper of the Indian people in Manitoba. We have very good organization, and I must say, probably the best one is the Manitoba one. And when you come with a presentation like this one, I'm glad to accept this for the Canadian government. We will study that. I hope that we will bring action as fast as possible. So we didn't receive a formal response from the government. That was totally unacceptable, totally unexpected, and absolutely shameful. That, that was just, um, even now, looking back, I'm thinking, how was that possible that they would not have respect, not just the document itself and, and the information in it, but how could they disrespect like the first people of, of Manitoba? What did I think when there's no response from the government? I suppose we're quite used to that, you know. We put a lot of effort into uh, stating our uh, positions on things. And at that time, there may not have been an official response, but there was definitely an impact. So it, it wasn't all lost, and the impact was really rather great. The most important thing was to have some control of our education, take control of our education. The efforts were um, next put into education. And that, that was a very worthwhile effort because it was a, a practical solution um, to a, a really important underlying topic. A lot has changed and uh, there was more um, cooperation and uh, working together with the Indian Affairs in the, the region. The Manitoba region, they seem to extend themselves to try and work with with Dave uh, more, uh, m more than they had before. Well, Dave really believed in the grassroots and he, he was that kind of person to try to ensure that he was hearing the right things. And he saw a different relationship whereby it wouldn't be a relationship of dependency and uh, he was a very effective um, leader and politician. And where the hell has been the Canadian people as a whole? All Canadian people. To let this thing go so far and so long to see generation after generation of people being destroyed. You know, I, uh, I remember you know, the, the toughness of, of my father. And I, and I, sometimes I believed he was too hard on me. And then, you know, through the compassion and the kindness of my mother, she would tell me, she said, uh, Dad knows what he's doing. She says, one day you're gonna, you're gonna remember why your father was so tough. In my journey with him during his political career, no matter where he went and as I traveled with him, he never, never overstepped the elders. That he would, that those were the ones that he went to first. He talked to them, he laughed with them, you know, and the elders was where the knowledge was and he knew it. He knew where the knowledge was and it was within the elders. You have before you description, detailed, documented descriptions of the conditions in which we live. They need no elaboration by me, for they are devastating. 
a devastating indictment of the Canadian society, of the Canadian people as a whole, of their institutions, of all their institutions, of Canada before the world. He provided leadership in so many ways. He really was such a great facilitator for getting the job done and gathering his team together. We were working on Wabung. Even then, there were six of us women who were in charge of areas. Another person was in health, another was in community development, another one in uh, social development and education. So even back in 71, we were called upon to take on these important roles. At the time, I was a bit of a radical, and uh, I made sure that I was treated on an equal basis. I guess I was a little bit aggressive in that area in terms of uh, being a woman in a, in a man's world, it seemed. And of course, we had Janet Fontaine and uh, Verna Kirkness. They weren't meek women, put it that way. <laughs> Maybe look at uh, people like Jean Folster, uh, who uh, was the leader of her people many, many years ago. She did represent one of the biggest uh, tribes in Manitoba. And one of our evidences of such progress is that for the first time, we have an Indian woman as a chief. And to present the cultural aspect of our feelings, I would like to call on Mrs. Jean Falster, Chief of Norway House Band, to present our views on behalf of the Manitoba Indians. It just brings a smile to my face now to think of, of Jean Falster and her coming into power. It, it was a reflection of the wisdom of the community, I, I think. When you look back on it, you realize that the, the women who, who contributed to Wabang were many, and I'm thinking of, of some of, of the women without whom it would have been totally impossible to get this job done, who were in the support positions. Um, they, they kept the organization rolling. We were uh, more than capable of holding up our half of the sky. The, the women have always had uh, a leading role in, in our lives. And I think that's the acknowledgement that they need to, they need to be, that they need to receive, you know, is how well that they took care of us. And in the development of, of, the, of, of Wabang, you know, the spirit of the voice of women is very, very much a part of it. The women carry something, you know, that is added, I think, in terms of uh, having more strength. In, in their voice, which is the voice of, of the love of the child. Um, I had the feeling that, okay, if, if this is all right, it's going, to, it's going to last, and it's going to be relevant to our lives now and, and in the future. But I really can't say that I was thinking that it would be completely relevant today. I'm just thrilled that it stood the test of time. There is importance to the document today in terms of how we express ourselves to the external community. We can focus less on Wabung because it is our external document. It is for world consumption. It is for public consumption. Whereas internally we have our own politics, which is often informed by our attachments to our language, our traditions, our customs, and our ceremonies. What we're doing now is we belong in the movement to continue to have more self-determination in the era of truth and reconciliation, be able to go beyond Wabang. You will find the spirit of the people within that document. And that spirit is to, to reclaim our right of identity as a people. What's important is that, uh, is that we must find the courage to take full responsibility in determining our own self-determination as a people. You should know your language and unfortunately because of residential schools um, that cycle was broken. You can't um, just say you're Indian, which is what I heard for a long, long time. 
but you must know if you're Cree, if you're uh, Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, or, you know, Dene, or Dakota, or whatever. You, you should know. If you know who you are, if you pretend to be something else that you're not, or you don't know, I mean, how, how can you be a strong person? I see a, a day when, when we can wipe out the disparity so that we are not stuck in poverty. Our tomorrows are today as well. Wabung really opened that door, you know, to create these opportunities for us, you know, to come forward to be the real leaders. And I think by just by, you know, knowing and understanding that part of history that, you know, when the document was, was developed and written, that it applies just as much today as it did at that time. Wabung to me is uh, encouraging us to go back to the beginning and to remember who we are, to remember our creation stories, to remember the duties and the responsibilities that we were given, you know, how to be a good people, how to be a strong people, and how to be a spiritual people. <laughs>